Back in the studio, this is Unconquered with Doc Staples. As always, this podcast brought to you by EPR Creations, bringing you the best of internet marketing and website development for an affordable price by Luis Marquez of Keller Williams Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, by Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. As you all know, I, don't, I haven't just taken any advertisers. I only accept the ones I really believe in. And I, I will say, right now is a good time to start looking for real estate. And if you do buy a home in Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, or Kentucky, give Justin a call. Let him know you heard about him from Unconquered with Doc Staples. You'll be glad you did. He will make sure you get the absolute best service and the best rates possible in the mortgage loan space. All right. Well, it's been a little bit. It's the time of year, the silly season between uh, between the end of season and spring, where both uh, professionally and my other stuff, and also because there's a little bit less to talk about, uh, I, I end up, uh, the last few years, I've recorded few epi- fewer episodes. I'm not going to just record for the sake of recording, though there have been some things I've wanted to record on, and uh, other things have intervened. Uh, Still planning on getting a a few more uh, pieces done on the situation with the ACC. Obviously, Florida State just gained another ally in the courts with Clemson uh, filing suit against the ACC in South Carolina court. And then uh, and then they actually beat the ACC to uh, to the courts in this case because they don't have to deal with the sunshine laws situation that Florida has. So uh, the ACC was unable to venue shop for for that case, though they did again file after the fact. But Clemson is going to beat them to it did beat them to the court. And so that one should be uh, should be handled in South Carolina. Now, the interesting question, and this is something that when I when I get the uh, the, the legal experts involved here, uh, this will be something that I want to I want to discuss with them. Now that you have multiple states involved in multiple institutions in multiple states, the larger impact of this and and how some of these cases may end up being considered together and all of that uh, gets gets pretty interesting. So we'll talk about that at a later time. But uh, all I really have to say as far as Clemson is concerned is welcome to the party, pal. They a little bit late getting things getting things going, but they're uh, they're they're joining the whole mix. And at this point, given the two cases, uh, you have to think that things are speeding towards a a settlement because ultimately the ACC really can't afford to fight this kind of legal battle on that many fronts. And, you know, it's not, I don't think it's, you know, that much longer before we see a third, uh, a third entry here. And, you know, the ACC at, at, at a certain point is going to have to determine what, uh, what the legal fees and what the continued legal battles are worth. Now we're talking about a lot of money on the table here. So they're they're going to want to stick with it for a while, but as these cases start to uh, start to add up, and there seem to be some indications that that the that there's actually some case to be made against the ACC, and and surprisingly, in my resp- in 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 my view, that that some of the case stuff that uh, that some of the details from the Florida State and Clemson side are as strong as they are. I mean, it's just due to the ACC having had some significant missteps to this point, but. Uh, it's surprising that the case has been this strong. And with the ACC, they're going to have to to ultimately determine once you've got multiple members that are doing this and the possibility that these things could wind up be- getting worse and worse, how quickly do you just decide to go ahead and settle and move into the next phase of the conference's existence and you know decide that you're just not going to play big boy football. You're not going to be a part of that mix anymore. Uh, that's the real question. And yeah, I mean, I will say this. I, when this whole thing began, my my expectation was that Florida State would probably end up settling with the ACC for something like a quarter, a quarter of a billion dollars. Somewhere, you know, around 250, $275 million would be where I was expecting things would probably wind up when Florida State first indicated that they were going to be filing suit. And then I looked at the FSU case 
and I've you know paid some attention to. And one of the reasons I actually haven't recorded uh, another episode is that I've been trying to keep up with the with the legal filings, and there's a whole lot to read in there and to digest. And ultimately, uh, I, I just haven't been able to keep up with it as much as I'd like to be able to to uh, to give an informed opinion on everything at this point. And that's why I'm going to need to uh, to bring some other folks in. But, uh, but yeah, when I when I looked at that stuff and saw that saw some of the things that the ACC had done that potentially violate their own bylaws and all of those things, which then gives Florida state a reasonable out on some of this stuff. Then you go, Oh wow. Okay. They've got a stronger case than it looks like, uh, or than it, than, than it looked like, uh, uh, up front. So now with, with Clemson joining as well, and with some of these other things, I, I, I don't think Florida state pays anywhere close to that. And, you know, I do expect that this ends up settling. It's it's one of those things where if you are, if you're Florida State, the risk of getting, go, you know, of going the whole way and getting a decision that says, no, you have to pay if you want to get out, you know, here, you, you signed on the dotted line, here's what you have to pay. The risk of that is just high enough that, there's got to be a figure you're willing to settle for to avoid the risk. And if you're the ACC, the possibility that the court might just say, you got to pay zero. No, this is invalid. You got to pay zero because of X, Y, and Z. The risk of that is high enough, just high enough. Even if it's an, even if it's 5%, it's non-zero at a certain point, the risk gets high enough that you're willing to take, you know, pennies or nickels or dimes on the dollar to make sure that you don't get nothing. So at some point there's going to be the, the, the likelihood of, of, of this kind of uh, this kind of action in the courts is pretty much always going to be settlement. And, you know, with Clemson joining in, you, you got to think the, uh, the, the movement towards a settlement is going to, is going to be faster now, but again, I'm going to deal with that in a future episode coming up uh, as I've, as I'm able to, uh, to, to, get some questions ready for the legal expert uh, who, who I'm going to bring on the show and, uh, and, and discuss this with who can take us through this stuff a whole lot better than I can. So, uh, so anyway, th th those are my initial thoughts here uh, just based on the, the materials from the last week or so. Now, moving into the other part of the show here, uh, I actually wanted to, to take this off of a question I got uh, via uh via a listener to, to kind of think through the way to, to in, introduce this sort of opening spring evaluation, you know, what, what we're looking for. So basically the question was this, uh, as spring practice opens for Florida state, what are some of the things you're looking for? Number one, what would you need to see that will give you optimism for this team? And two, what are some things that could happen that would be a cause for concern. So in some sense, those two things are two sides of the same coin, but I want to take those sort of one by one and talk about coming into the spring, what my, what my thoughts are on those things. And then we'll talk a little bit about, um, about the remainder of sort of how I'm thinking about, about evaluating the spring. So first of all, what would I need to see that will give me optimism for this team? So, if I'm thinking about year over year, and this is something I've talked about for the last few years, anytime I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating, I'm going into a season and evaluating what a team can be. What I try to do is I look at what that team was the year before and, you know, injury luck and those things are also a factor, but I look at that team and what they were bef the year before in terms of the overall depth chart. And then I try to evaluate sort of position by position, position group by position group, is this team better or worse than they were at this spot or at this position group than they were last year? And that kind of gives you a range for where they should be the following year. So if a team improves at more positions and at the more important positions than they, the opposite, then that I expect that that team should be a better team. Now that doesn't mean a better record. Because, you, again, you have to account for injury luck, for 
turnover luck, some of those things. But it does mean that you can sort of evaluate on the aggregate this team you should expect to be better than than the prior or worse than the prior. So we've talked about that over the years. And so when I look at this team, when I look at this team versus the 2023 team, and we all know that 2023 team was special. I start going through the list and I go, okay, where, where is this team? Where's this team going to be better? Where's this team going to be worse? So just looking at it by position group at cornerback, it's basically the same football team minus Renardo green, who was the best corner on the team last year. But AZ Thomas then steps into that role and you've got a lot of talent behind him. So, you know, with Cypress at one corner, AZ Thomas at another, and then also you lose Jerry and Jones, who was maybe the best slot corner in the country last year. You basically take AZ Thomas, Cypress as well, and then now you slot in Earl Little at that nickel spot. And is that better or worse or even? And I would say you you know, based on last year and how good that group was and how good Jerry and Jones was, how good Renardo Green was, maybe you expect a slight decline, but it could be even or maybe even better if AZ Thomas and Earl Little really play great and Cypress takes another step and the young guys, you know, are there's a little more depth. So it's possible. So I'm going to call that, you know, close to a toss up at safety. You got Shaheem Brown and then. Instead of having Kevin Knowles as the field safety, you're going to be trying to figure out who among Devontae Brown, Ashlyn Barker, Conrad Hussey, KJ Kirkland, one of those guys is going to be the field safety. And you're going to rotate some of those guys. And the young guys are a year older, and you're bringing in Brown, who's more of a, an old head, to try to resolve that field safety position. I think you're basically a little better maybe at that spot because you feel good about Hussey and Kirkland and Brown being better at that spot than Knowles was who Knowles just was not, he didn't have the, the, the body to play field safety. So overall in the secondary you could call that a wash, maybe a little better. If things break right, it's possible that the secondary could be even better at linebacker. You're going to be worse. You lose the Loach, you lose Bethune. Those two guys were rocks. You move Lundy from a, you know, number three, you know, rotational linebacker to a starter. And then you bring in Sean Murphy. You're you're just, I don't think you can expect that group, even with Nicholson and Cryer, you know, taking steps forward uh, to be as good as you were at backer last year. Okay. So then, then at defensive end, you're going to be worse, not having Jared verse, but you had some serious problems last year in terms of depth. As soon as Verse was off the field, they had problems. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But deeper at the at the edge spot. So in terms of overall depth and overall edge, maybe you could call it close to a wash, but you're missing that splash potential from an elite, elite player in Verse. And similarly, at, at defensive tackle, this is where my big concern is for this team. You know, linebacker and defensive tackle are are really the spots that I, ha- I have the most concerns. It's because you just lose a lot of big, important bodies at defensive tackle. Most notably, Braden Fisk, who was an absolute disruption machine on the interior. Where are you going to get those disruptive reps for? And so if I'm looking at a theme for this defense compared to last year, what I'm asking is, where are the splash plays going to come from? on the defense. You're trying to replace the disruption from Verse and Fisk and also Deloach. Those guys created a bunch of big plays defensively. They generated havoc. Where's the havoc going to come from on this team? So, and then secondly, defensive tackle depth. They were so deep on the defensive tackle uh, at the defensive tackle spot last year that that allowed them to rotate and stay fresh and still, still be really good down down the stretch. Are they going to be able to do that this year? So for me, if I'm looking at this, what would I need to see that would give me optimism on the defensive side? First and foremost, I'm looking at defensive tackle development. Most of all, I'm looking at KJ Sampson because right now, I think you feel really good about Daryl Jackson and Joshua Farmer as starters. I'm not I don't think either one of those guys is going to be as disruptive as Braden Fisk and if you look at how Fisk tested at the NFL Combine, you can see why. You feel fine about Grady Kelly, but again, you know, really more of a depth guy. 
And Daniel Lyons is a guy that you expect to take a step forward. But really, it's Grady Kelly, Daniel Lyons, and K.J. Sampson that need to take significant steps forward for me to feel like the defensive tackle position is is in a healthy spot. Because right now, you feel good about your starters. You feel like Lyons should be a, a quality rotational guy as well. And Kelly, probably going to be maybe an upgrade over Malcolm Ray from last year. But... Malcolm Ray was really your fifth guy last year. And Grady Kelly's probably your fourth this year. And, you know, you you lose not only Fisk, but you lose uh, Malcolm Ray, who's, you know, your fifth guy, really. And you lose uh, Fabian Lovett. Those are, those are big losses on the interior. So I look at that and I say, okay, you feel really good about Jackson and Farmer. Kelly needs to be a quality, quality depth player, rotational player who can play basically starter reps along with Jackson and Farmer to keep those guys from getting banged up because this is a really long season now. Lions needs to be able to hold up not only as a as a situational guy now, but as a true rotational guy. And that's four. In my view, you need six. You've got to have six quality defensive tackles that can play that are ready to go, that can rotate. And I think they're one short. And that's one short if KJ Sampson steps forward and becomes that dude. Now, to me, that's one of the things I'm looking for the most. If I'm looking, if I'm going to be optimistic, then I want to hear that Grady Kelly, Daniel Lyons, and KJ Sampson are having stellar springs and great off seasons. And maybe that Jamori flag is way better than expected and might be able to contribute a little bit, you know, a few reps here and there. But I, I still think they're, they're, they're one quality body short at defensive tackle from being where they were last year and what, and what they, and doing what they want to do. Now question is, can Tomiwa Durojaye maybe be one of those guys that slides in and rotates in there on passing downs as well? At which point then now you're closer to closer to having the, the, num- the number of guys on the, on the defensive tackle spot that you need. So maybe that, maybe that's how they, they handle that. But to me, that's, that's one of the things I'm looking at the most. And if I start hearing really positive things about those guys and seeing really positive things about that, that group, Kelly Lyons and Samson on the interior, my optimism for the season goes up. Second thing for me is Sean Murphy has to show that he is a dude at linebacker and a guy who can cover. Because the concerns for him, look, there's no question about that guy being a, being a physical guy and, and being able to come up and, and tackle against the run. I think he triggers really well. He's going to be good against the run. Question is, can he cover well enough to compensate for the loss of Bethune and, uh, and especially Deloach? Deloach was a was a top level cover guy. He was like a safety at linebacker. Can Murphy come close to that? And you know we know what Lundy is. Can Nicholson and Cryer be rotational guys that are reliable along with Omar Graham? So there's still some stuff to work through there. But you know I I, I want to I want I will be optimistic, more optimistic if I start hearing really positive and seeing really positive things from Sean Murphy. Finally, on that side of the ball, I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, I feel really positive if I hear that the edge players are really establishing a solid rotation. I think looking at, and and this is one of the things that I did since the last audio recording, those of you who are on Patreon and and, uh, on YouTube as well, uh, I did a breakdown of the Georgia Georgia Bowl game, looking at the defense and what went wrong defensively. And the main, the main thing that Georgia did is they figured out Florida State couldn't hold up on the edge at all with the personnel that they took into the, into the, into the Orange Bowl. I mean, it's just straightforward. They just, they just mashed those guys on the edge. With no Jared Verse, Florida State was vulnerable to teams that could run the football with physicality on the edge. And they took advantage of the edge. They pushed those guys back. And then, you know, they're in the lap of the linebackers and the linebackers didn't play great either, but the linebackers played better than the, than the edge guys. And, you know, but Georgia just took advantage of the nickelback, the backers and the edge guys over and over and over again in that game. So 
FSU knew. That's why they went out and they got three guys in the transfer portal at edge. They knew that they couldn't come into this season with the edge looking like it did. And last year, as I've talked about before, Jared with Jared Verse on the, on the football field, Florida State had the number one defense in the country. The moment Jared Verse was on the sideline, they were the number 89 defense in the country. Number one in the country with Jared Verse on the field, number 89 with Jared Verse on the sideline. That's a huge drop-off. Now, that's why you go out and you get these guys. I think there are going to be a, a number of teams and certain down and distance and situational stuff where you're going to have to see Lolohea and Duro Jai on the field at the same time. They're going to want to go big. You put those two guys out there with the two with two defensive tackles and you let them hold up against the run. You play light box and you can do a lot. Those big bodies are going to matter. And then there's going to be times where you're going to want to maybe slide Duro Jai inside and put Marvin Jones and Patrick Payton on the field at the same time. And then there's going to be a number of cases where you're going to want one of Lolohea or Duro Jaye on the field and one of Peyton or Jones on the field. And you can you know, kind of let those guys eat. But to me, that four needs to really establish that they are a solid rotation and that they can prove that they, that they're going to be able to fill that gap. And ideally you're wanting to hear that Jones in particular or Duro Jaye, you're looking at the guys with the more explosive splash potential are able to do some of the things that Jared Verse was able to do. You're not going to replace Jared Verse. You're not going to replace all the di- all that disruption and the havoc that he was able to produce. But how close can you get to handling on the aggregate what you got from that spot in key places last year? I want to hear very positive things from the edge position. If Marvin Jones in particular can show that he's blowing up in practice, that's a, that's that's a sign of optimism. All right. Now on the offensive side, what do I, how do I evaluate this? So start at the wide receiver position. You got, you you lose Johnny Wilson, you lose uh, Keon Coleman. That's, uh, you know, that's pretty big. You're, you're not going to upgrade in that, uh, at that position. The question is, what can you get to, you know, compensate to some degree? And what they did is they went out and they got Malik Benson, got a lot faster on the one side. And then you're hoping that a healthy Darian Williamson, uh, Hakeem Williams, they picked up Jalen Brown as well. I think he's probably going to play a little more in the slot. Uh, you know, a healthy Destin Hill. They're hoping that some of these other guys are able to step up and, and compensate for the loss of, of the two freaks that, they, that they're losing. So on the one hand, it's obvious that they're not going to be better at wide receiver. On the other hand, it's a change in kind of what they're bringing to the table, the kind of guys they're bringing to the table. Because these guys can all run. They're all faster than the guys that they're losing. You're losing kind of the freak show, mismatch, just, you know, huge catch radius type guys. But you are potentially adding more long, you know, big plays. So I think this is a little bit of a, a little bit of a diminishment, but not a huge down, uh, a huge drop off compared to what what you had last year with Wilson and and, and Keon, just because of the speed, uh, the speed increase. And again, Hakeem Williams and, and Destin Hill, the the talent is there, you know. So, for me, looking at that position, what would make me optimistic is hearing that Malik Benson is a, is a true number one. To me, this offense completely changes if Malik Benson, who's a ten four hundred meter guy plays like a true number one in this offense. I think he needs to be the number one in this offense. Because I think Hakeem Williams, Destin Hill, Darian Williamson, all those guys are really, really good number twos or one A's in this offense for next year. If you've got a Malik Benson who can just be, you got to have a guy. I want to hear that there's a guy who's becoming a a mismatch, a matchup nightmare. If there, if you, if you're hearing that this guy is just, he's nobody's covering this guy, and he's just running away from people, you get that. And Benson to me is the guy that's the most likely to be that on this roster. When I went and I looked at him and I evaluated him, it was like he's the number one. He's got to be your number one because he not only has that speed and the burst, but he's the guy that I think has. I think he's got really natural hands. I think this is a guy that could be, you know, kind first round type player. And I think he got hidden at, at Alabama partly because they were playing a running back at quarterback. 
So really good opportunities here for him. The second thing for me is I look at the quarterback position, and I think the quarterback position, as good as Jordan Travis was, Travis did, they did call around some of Travis's weaknesses. And he was not a guy that was, you know, able to push the ball downfield with a bunch of accuracy over and over again. He missed a lot in the strike zone, in my view. Not, you know, not the most accurate thrower last year at times and, and struggled some in terms of, you know, in the strike zone accuracy. I want to see, can DJ Uyunglele, uh actually locate the football with consistency during the spring? Because it's the consistency that has been a weaker point for him. He's flashed the ability throughout his career to make big time throws and to push the ball downfield at an elite level. But consistency and you know making sure that every ball is in the right spot has been a weaker point for him. I want to I want to see consistency there. Again, seeing consistency there and then seeing the connection between him and Malik Benson. That would be cause for optimism. Final thing on the offensive side, I think the interior offensive line, I think it's no no question that that should be better than it was last year. I thought they were, I thought they had some weaknesses at guard last year. And I thought last year going in, they should be a little bit better than they were the year before because of how they'd been banged up the year before, but it turned out they were not. This year, you look at Richie Leonard, you look at Terrence Ferguson as additions on the interior. I think Julian Armella is going to get some reps at, at, at guard as well. You look at the addition of Rizzi, who comes in the summer. I think they're they're deeper and better on the interior at the guard and center spots than they were last year. The question for me is at tackle. Now, Robert Scott, as we expected, had surgery after the season. He fought. He was a warrior last year. He needed surgery basically from the beginning of the season and just tried to gut it out all season. Got the surgery. He's not going to be out there in the spring. But now you've got Washington and Byers as your main as your main tackles. Question is, can you get one of those other guys to step up? This to me is one of the other really really big things I'm looking for in this spring. If you can get indications that Lucas Simmons is ready to actually be a rotational piece, a reliable rotational piece, <laughs> this, that, that, that raises the ceiling of this team immensely. If Lucas Simmons is going out there and getting wins against Patrick Payton and Marvin Jones and Sione Lolohea and Tomiwa du- uh, Durojaye and the rest, and he's actually handling his business in 11 on 11, okay, now, now we're cooking with gas. And Byers taking another step forward, okay, that's solid. Those are all things that for me, if they can have four tackles going into next year, Washington, Scott, Byers, and and Simmons that are all playing at that level. And that's not even bringing in Jalen Early, who can also play out there. But Early needs to gain some weight. So it's another thing. But to me, can they get a fourth tackle, including Scott, who's sitting out? Can they get a fourth tackle that's going to be reliable? They do that, again, cause for optimism. Now, on the flip side, what are some things that w- that could happen that would be a cause for concern for me? Well, number one is always injuries. That That's number one. Number two is hearing that DJ Uyunglele is struggling with some accuracy or just, you know, throwing picks, not, not really fully grasping the system, that sort of thing. Uh, number, t- n- number three, defensive tackles not taking the step that they need. So if we're not hearing really positive things about Samson, not seeing great stuff from Samson, Lyons, and Kelly, that's an issue. And then the other one here that I didn't really discuss in the, the positives, the other one, because I, I really expect it. It's not something I, I, I need to hear so much uh, praise about. But if I'm, if I don't, if I, if there's a sense that Earl Little is not actually going to be playing at close to the level that Jerry and Jones did last year at the nickel spot. That's a real concern. Earl little needs to be a clear answer at that nickel spot at that star spot. And if Earl little is not that, that would be something that would, that would be a cause for consi- for significant concern for me. I think he needs to be the dude that he needs to be that dude in the secondary that can that can play in that role and be a a dynamite player. So for me the concerns that I would be looking at 
passing game sort of hiccuping and struggling a bunch with the new quarterback and the wide receivers and accuracy issues there. Defensive tackles not taking the step and Earl Little not being the answer at slot corner. Those would be the big concerns that I would have. Now, going into spring, I'll be clear. I think this is a better and deeper roster overall than it was in 2023. I think there's fewer places where you look at and you're like, oh man, if that guy goes down, they're just absolutely screwed. Like last year at the edge position, when Jared Verse wasn't on the field, they were not good. Last year, when, you know, one of the three main backers wasn't on the field, they were, they were in, they were in trouble. Last year, it, when, you know, you had a loss of a co- at the quarterback position. Jordan Travis goes down and it was a, it was an issue turned out to be the issue last year at tackle or guard. They had some, some depth things. Still you look through, you look down this roster and you go, okay, where is a, where is a spot where they just don't have quality guys at that number two spot? Where is a spot on this team where the second team just doesn't have a you know a top level ACC SEC type player. And there aren't many of them. I mean, you got you got those dudes through the two deep at both corners, both edges, wide receiver, running back. I think at quarterback you do now with Brock Glenn having had some some uh, some experience. I think the offensive line, as long as one guy steps up at offensive tackle, I think they're there on the offensive line. So for me, again, it's the depth at at defensive tackle that's a concern and the depth at at linebacker that's a concern. Those are the only places. And that's that's only the depth at defensive tackle, and I think that's the whole linebacker position. But I think they'll be, I actually think they'll be fine at linebacker. Still a little more concerned about the situation in terms of bodies at, at defensive tackle. But, you know, I I look at this team and I think they're going to be better on the offensive tackle or at the on the offensive line because of more depth and and more quality players on the interior and basically the same players with more depth at offensive tackle. And then, you know, I think you've got the, the problem in terms of depth at edge basically settled as long as as you stay healthy there. Now, the difference, though, is that while this roster, I think, is a better and deeper roster than it was in 2023, again, the issue is at the very, very, very top of the roster, you have less proven elite splash play production. Offensively, Uyunglele might actually be, in terms of play on the field, an upgrade, especially in the passing game compared to Jordan Travis might be though. What you don't know is that he will be in this offense. And you knew going into 2023, Jordan Travis was fully in control of this offense. And you knew what he could do in terms of the splash plays in big games, the kind of things that the kind of damage that he could do to a quality defense because of his dual threat ability. That guy was a, that guy was a problem for defenses. Can Uya Ungalale be that? We don't know. Last year, you knew that when the chips were down and you had Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman on the field, well, good luck. Good luck, defense. One of those guys is going to be able to go up and, and, and get it on you. Ask Clemson. Go into overtime. What happens? Keon. Do you have any one of these wide receivers, let alone two, that are going to become that dude. Right? That's the question. I think the overall wide receiver position group is probably overall a little deeper and better than last year. But do you have that dude? Last year, you had two number ones. One was a little bit inconsistent, and the other one got banged up. But you had two number ones. This year, do you have one? You could have three. But we don't know. Last year going in, you knew you had Keon and Johnny and they were freaking dudes. Similar at tight end. Last year, you knew 
that you had a dude who had just transferred in from South Carolina. Plus Morlock. This year, you've got Morlock, and then you've got a bunch of guys with him that, you know, there's not that dude who's the, mis- the mismatch there. So there's fewer of the, of the sure thing elite splash play guys. At running back, last year, you had Benson. And you knew that you give that to Trey Benson, and you give him enough carries, and at some point, he could go 80. Because he's just that dude. Do you have one of those this year? I think Roydell Williams is going to give you more consistency play play by play in terms of he's less likely to get stopped for, you know, a gain of one or, you know, minus one or or two yards. I think I think he's actually got a little better vision, probably going to give you give you a little more consistency down to down success rate type player. But he doesn't he doesn't have I mean, very few guys have what Trey Benson has in terms of that down in terms of that speed. Again, look at how Benson tested. Can Cameron Davis be that guy? The question is at the top end of this roster. That's the question. Last year, the top end was elite. The depth and some of those other things had more question marks. This year's roster is kind of flip. You know the, that the roster is pretty solid across the board, and they've got some guys that could be really good. But, yeah, that's the question. And on the defense, you're, you know, you had you had some issues in terms of you know some of the depth, but you get into the fourth quarter against a good team, and that good team has to block Fisk and and Verse, and Deloach just might decide to blitz from one side too. Again, the elite production is there. Are you going to get that from this group? Who's going to be that guy? I look at it and I go, Marvin Jones Jr. is probably the guy that could be that could become that, that could be a monster. Duro Jaye could take that step, but we don't know that they that they're gonna be that guy. We knew going into last year that Deloach was a big play waiting to happen at linebacker. We don't know that they have one of those guys. Murphy should be a really solid player. Can he be that disruptor? And last year, you know, we didn't know this going in, but it turned out that Jerry and Jones was that kind of guy at, at nickel. Can Earl Little be that guy? Can, last year, one of the one of the secrets of last year's defense was that when teams spread that team out, they could match up at linebacker and slot corner with uh, Deloach, with Bethune, and with uh, with Jerry and Jones. And teams couldn't just pick them apart on the interior because those guys were consistently covered. Look at the look at what happened when Louisville went after Deloach or, or went after uh, Bethune in the ACC championship game. Bethune ultimately got that pick that changed that game because you had guys that just that interior three, your Will, your Mike, and your Star. Those guys were so good in coverage; they were elite in coverage, essentially that. Teams couldn't pick on him. This year, you got three different players at that spot. Who's are they going to be at that level? Can you get the consistency and ability to match up in coverage that way? You're looking at Murphy, Lundy, Nicholson, Cryer, maybe our Omar Graham in there too, but Nicholson or Cryer probably need to be that guy. And then Earl Little. Can they can they get to that level? That's the thing for me. So you know what you have. You know you've got a, a solid roster that should compete for the ACC title. But it's the top end, the splash stuff, that you got to figure out. Who's going to be those guys that are unblockable when the chips are down? When, you know, late in the game, in the ACC title game, or, you know, in the swamp, that sort of thing. They're not going to play in the swamp next year, but whatever. You know, where are your big plays going to come from on offense? And I do think, by the way, this is going to be more of a big play passing offense than it was last year. Last year was more of a bailout offense, passing wise, sort of a duck and chuck and or chuck and duck, and then uh, let the big receiver go up and get it. This year is more push the ball down the field and let the let the fast receivers run away. So we'll see. I think more big plays there, and that and that may may be a, a 
a significant difference. I mean, I think last year they depended on the running game for the big plays. This year, I think it'll be more passing game. Running game will be a little bit more consistent this year than last year because of the differences in the offensive line in particular. But that that's how I'm thinking going into the spring. Those are the things that I'm looking at. Like I said, I think this is a solid roster. I think they're basically one player short of what I would really like to see. And that's, a, that's that extra dude at, at defensive tackle. But everywhere else I look, I go, yeah, man, they could be that guy. They could, they could be good enough to contend, to be a playoff type contender. You know, somebody that's a team that could go deep and contend for a, for a national title. But in order to do that, you've got to have the top end guys on your team turn out to be elite. We don't know that yet. Last year, going in, had a pretty good idea. This year, not so much. It's going to be really, really interesting. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap there. It's good to be back. Hopefully, uh, get some more stuff recorded here in the very near future. But uh, until then, this has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. Thanks for listening. If you've been enjoying this podcast, please leave a five-star rating over at Apple Podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Post and repost episodes on social media and tell a friend. And if you haven't left a review in a while, do it again. It really does help the visibility of the podcast. Before we go, I'd also like to thank my advertising partners once more. That's EPR Creations, Louis Marquez of Keller Williams Realty in Jacksonville, Florida, Shenandoah Real Estate in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, Garage Makeovers, the number one garage remodeling company in South Florida, and Justin Galloway of Benchmark Mortgage, serving Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. You can also stop by the Unconquered shop at unconqueredpodcast.com where you can buy stickers, pins, magnets, t-shirts, and other swag. And thanks also to all those supporters over at Patreon where I post video analysis and field questions for the podcast. I am especially grateful to those above the dynasty level. That is Andrew Garrett, Brian Leininger, Neil Cook, Casey Kidd, Chris Chartrand, Dave Blair, Hector Cartagena, Jack Horton, Jimmy Van, Jonathan Kennedy, Keith Cheney, Lee Caswell, Tyler Kashishke, Vince Calandra, and Bert Bertoldi. You all are far more generous than I deserve. I'm really grateful. Thanks to you all. This has been Unconquered with Doc Staples. I'm your host, Jason Staples. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. I made this. <laughs>